Okay. So, um, we have a sort of shift that is starting today. Much of what we've been doing in the class has been heavily conceptual. That is, what is a phylogenetic tree? What are the different parts of a tree? How do we map groups of taxa onto a tree? Um, how do we map characters onto a tree? How do we infer a phylogenetic tree? And so on. Uh, most of the things you need to know from that are like how to do things. How to analyze a tree, how to analyze characters. There are some sort of definitions that we went through, but not a lot of sort of biological facts. I also posted on Smart Site some little uh, summaries of the topics we covered in those uh, first lectures on phylogeny, and then also the couple of lectures that we've done on the tree of life itself, sort of been a, a mix between concepts and some details about, say, what the rooting actually is and the genes that were used. Um, we're now going to shift a little bit more into um, facts about organisms, in particular microorganisms. There's still going to be concepts that drive most of the lectures, and I'll go through this in a second, but uh, you're going to have to start to gear up for, for example, reading chapters 26 and 27 in the book and learning some of the details that are in there, whereas chapter 22, the phylogeny chapter in the book, was really supplemental to the lectures to help you understand things, maybe if you didn't understand what we were doing in lecture. Um, so what I'm going to do in, the, in, in this lecture and in the next lecture is, in essence, take you on an introduction to microbial diversity, various aspects of microbial diversity. And I'm going to focus basically on a few different, what you could call categories of microbial diversity. Diversity of form of organisms, some different aspects of that. Diversity of function of organisms. And then phylogenetic diversity, which is the way we sort of interpret the diversity of forms and functions. Um, in lecture 10, we're going to talk about uh, two related topics that relate to how organisms, in essence, steal functions from other taxa. Um, one of these is going to relate to taking genes from other organisms, something called lateral gene transfer. And the other is going to relate to actually, in essence, taking whole organisms into yourself, a process called endosymbiosis. And that these both relate to, are very important in the general process of evolution as it relates to microbes. In lecture 11, we're going to talk about... Uh, a certain class of microbes called extremophiles, organisms that live and tolerate in extreme conditions. And, and we'll talk about extremophiles in their biology a little bit, but we're also going to use that lecture to talk about how people study microorganisms, the various means by which we might learn about their biology when we can't generally see them very well, at least out in the field. And then in the last lecture on microbes, we're going to talk about microbes associated with people. So microbes that either make us sick or hopefully don't make us sick. And a lot of the information that I'm going to cover in these lectures directly relates to material in chapters 26 and 27. However, uh, unlike the conceptual lectures that we did before, there's just no way I'm going to be able to cover all of the diversity of microbes uh, in the lectures. There are parts that you're going to have to know that are just in the textbook that I'm not going to be able to cover. And I'll try to point you and guide you uh, to what those are. The chapters aren't very long, and I don't expect you to memorize, for example, individual names of individual species. And I'll talk to you about what you're going to be expected to learn. But you really do have to read and understand what's in chapters 26 and 27. So um, what we're going to do today is a little bit of wrap-up uh, for this using the rooted tree of life to trace evolution of features of uh, organisms, and then talk about the diversity within the different groups. First, we're going to talk about that in the context of this rooted tree of life, and then I'm going to go through and give you, in essence, a, a little tour of some of the different aspects of um, diversity of microbes. Uh, so, so we already started... Oh, I, I may not have, uh, I tried to skip over some slides that we've already covered. I think I covered the ether linkages uh, in this section, so I'm just going to go ahead. Sorry, I, while I was up here, I was trying to skip over these slides, but it clearly didn't work. <laughs> 
So I think we ended where I was talking about the features that are unique to eukaryotes and found throughout eukaryotes. And there are an enormous number of these features. In general, the simplest evolutionary reconstruction for these features is to infer that they evolved on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of eukaryotes. In the lecture on endosymbiosis, we will talk in more detail about some theories to explain all of these features. But it's really important to understand these, did this, is this still working? Okay, so these um, features, in essence, have helped contribute to a misinterpretation of the evolution of organisms. So when people looked at the phenotype, the properties of various organisms on the planet, they grouped bacteria and archaea together into this group that was generally called prokaryotes. However, bacteria and archaea, according to this rooted tree of life, are not monophyletic. They are not sister taxa to each other. And the reason they got grouped together was that there were a lot of synapomorphies for eukaryotes that got misinterpreted as being features, in essence, synapomorphies of a group of bacteria and archaea. Without this rooted tree, you would never be able to figure that out. But instead, these features that all evolved along the eukaryotic branch, which we will discuss a few of these, those are features that should not be used to infer the relatedness of organisms per se. They are features that we can now interpret by overlaying onto the rooted tree that we generated with other information. So if you look at the cellular features of bacteria and archaea versus eukaryotes, you notice that they do in fact have many things in common. In general, these are the features they have in common relate to these features that evolved in eukaryotes. So for example, if you look at how they carry out what you could call the central dogma, the DNA to RNA to protein. That is, you transcribe DNA into RNA, and then some of those RNAs, the messenger RNAs, are translated into proteins. The way bacteria and archaea generally do this is very similar. They have um, small compact genomes. They frequently have a set of genes that code for proteins all in a row in one region of the genome that are made together into one very large RNA. That RNA is then translated at once into many different proteins. Those long contiguous RNAs, those regions are also called operons. So bacteria and archaea have these clusters of genes that are made together into this single giant RNA and as an operon, and then that RNA is translated into proteins. And one thing that's really important for the regulation and the biology of bacteria and archaea is that that translation process happens while transcription is going on. So you have the DNA, RNA polymerase, the enzyme that converts the DNA information into RNA, transcribes the RNA, so makes a long RNA piece. As soon as that RNA piece is made, in essence, the ribosomes grab onto that RNA piece and start making protein off of them. This allows bacteria and archaea to have regulatory processes where the translation of proteins and how that works can regulate even whether or not a gene is transcribed. It's a direct regulatory process of translation on transcription. Eukaryotes do not do this because they have a partitioning where the nucleus is where transcription happens inside this membrane-bound compartment. And then RNA is processed. Frequently there are what are called introns in the RNA where those are regions that are not going to make it into the final protein product. Those introns are cut out and then the RNA is exported out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. And that's where translation happens. Because of that decoupling, eukaryotes do not regulate transcription. They do not use translation processes to directly regulate transcription. Because translation is happening in a different part of the cell. They have all sorts of other regulatory processes that you should have learned about some of them in this 2 a but they do not, this decoupling is very important for the functioning of eukaryotes. 
The presence of these introns allows for enormous diversification in the final products that eukaryotes make out of individual genes. So if you have an individual gene that has, say, 10 introns, you can mix and match which introns get cut out and what exons, those are the parts that code for proteins, get stitched together to make an incredible diversity of final protein products. Bacteria and archaea generally do not do this for protein coding genes. So if you read those sections in the book that I suggested you look at to sort of review the basic molecular and cellular biology, you will find all sorts of features of eukaryotic cells that are different from what you see in bacteria and archaea. There are membrane-bound compartments like the Golgi apparatus and the endoplasmic reticulum and organelles like the mitochondria and chloroplasts, which we will talk about more, that are absent from bacteria and archaea. There are just an incredible number of events happened somewhere along this branch leading up to the common ancestor of eukaryotes. That is, in a part, what explains a lot of the fundamental differences between eukaryotes and bacteria and archaea. Another one is the mechanisms by which the cells replicate their genome and divide. So bacteria and archaea generally use a process called binary fission, where really they take their genome, they copy the genome, and then they split the cell in two, and one of each of the daughter cells gets a copy of the genome. Relatively simple, straightforward process. Many, if not most, eukaryotes, if they're just making copies of themselves, like are during the development of our bodies, use a process called mitosis. It is a little more complex than the binary fission process. In part, it is more complex because that's trying to make sure that each daughter cell gets each of the chromosomes present in the parental cell. You should know something about the mitosis process. For sexual development, there is also a specialized form of reproduction you will hear a lot more about when we talk about plants and animals and fungi, which is meiosis, which is what generates the haploid um, gametes. And you will learn that in much more detail. This type of thing is generally absent from bacteria and archaea. So I'm giving these as examples. You should familiarize yourself with many of the fundamental differences between eukaryotes, on the one hand, and bacteria and archaea. But you should understand that those do not tell us that bacteria and archaea are sister taxa. They simply are synapomorphies of eukaryotes, feature shared derived traits on the branch leading up to the common ancestor of eukaryotes. So one, one other thing which is, you know, just people find very interesting is bacteria and archaea, most of them have circular genomes. Their DNA is present in a circular piece. <coughs> Turns out that it is much easier to make a copy of a circular piece of DNA than it is to make a copy of a linear piece of DNA. The linear chromosomes of eukaryotes, it is very hard to copy the ends of those chromosomes. <coughs> You need a specialized process to copy the ends because the normal DNA replication processes can't quite copy the tips of one side of your chrom linear chromosomes. And so eukaryotes have a diversity of processes to make up for this. Many of them have an enzyme called telomerase, like we have, which makes little caps at the end of the chromosomes and keeps extending these caps as much as possible. Many people think that telomerase is important for cancer and aging. If you don't make the caps very well, cells might senesce or die if they're, you don't keep up with the telomeres when they're replicating. If you make a hyperactive telomerase, you can keep cells alive forever, which is cancer. So some of these fundamental differences between eukaryotes and bacteria and archaea are really important for various aspects of the biology of bacteria and archaea versus eukaryotes. I made a table which you can look at. This lists some of those sort of fundamental differences between eukaryotes and bacteria and archaea. That is, features that are shared by bacteria and archaea on the one hand versus eukaryotes. And you can use this to look through and familiarize yourself with the various things in this uh, table. We will talk about many, but not all of these. <coughs> 
So again, this sort of points to something pretty big happening in the branch leading up to the common ancestor of eukaryotes that led to all these differences. And we will talk about that again in the endosymbiosis lecture. Okay, so other than these features that distinguish eukaryotes on the one hand from bacteria and archaea, these other features that I showed you, like features that are widespread in bacteria but not found in archaea and eukaryotes, most of those are pretty rare. There are, bacteria are incredibly diverse. And if we look at them, they're very hard to find things that they all share in common with each other. <coughs> archaea is the same. They're very diverse. It's very hard to find things that they all share in common with each other. There are these things that we can do for eukaryotes and for some of those features that are in that table, but in general, there's not much else that you can find. There are many things, however, so there are few features that in essence look like this on the tree. But there are many features that we will talk about in the next three or four lectures that are unique to one branch of bacteria or unique to one branch of archaea. So one example, which is also given in the book, and we'll talk about this again in a little bit, is the cell envelope of bacteria. So I told you before that all bacteria have peptidoglycan, which is a compound in their cell wall. The cell envelope is actually the combination of the cell membrane. So that's this sort of um, uh, thing that surrounds all the cells. Um, it's a phospholipid. I think I have a drawing with this in here. So all bacteria, all cells are surrounded by a cell membrane. Almost all bacteria have, in addition, a cell wall made out of this peptidoglycan compound. However, there are two different classes of cell envelopes in bacteria. There's one class that's called gram-negative and one class that's called gram-positive. The name comes from a stain that you, the gram stain, that you add to cells, and if they stain with the stain, they're called gram-positives. The gram-positive cells might be what you would imagine a cell, outer sort of cell of a bacteria looking like. Here's the inside of the cell. Then they have a cell membrane made up of this um, double lipid bilayer with a hydrophobic part in the middle that sort of sticks together and these hydrophilic parts that um, sit in the liquid on the outside. And then outside of that double membrane is the peptidoglycan cell wall. This is in gram-positive bacteria. Somewhat surprisingly to many people, gram-negative bacteria, which actually are the vast majority of bacteria, have a second membrane on the outside of their cell wall. So they have one cell membrane, then a cell wall, then another cell membrane outside of that cell wall. They have a thinner peptidoglycan cell wall compared to the gram-positives. Now this turns out to be very important for a variety of antibiotic usages. Many antibiotics target cell wall <laughs> synthesis, but they work preferentially for either gram negatives or gram positives. This difference in the membrane structure, this extra membrane code on the gram negatives, affects whether or not certain <coughs> antibiotics can target them. So when you go into the doctor for a bacterial infection and you get treated with an antibiotic, frequently they will say, this is for gram positives. That's usually targeting something, some aspect of the cell wall of gram positives. So if you look at the evolution as we will in a little bit, gram positive is actually a feature shared by two major groups of bacteria. There are probably at least 50 major groups of bacteria only two of them have this gram-positive feature, and it appears that in most studies that people have done, those two groups are sister taxa. So it looks like the gram-positive feature evolved once in the evolutionary history of bacteria in the common ancestor of these two sister groups. You'll see in a little bit they have uh, uh, two of the six groups that we will go through for bacteria are these gram-positive groups. All the other groups of bacteria can basically can be considered gram-negative, although their exact structure of their cell envelope is not identical in all of them. So this type of pattern, one lineage of bacteria having a feature unique compared to everything else, is very common. 
That's what we'll see with eukaryotes as well. Animals have things that are distinct from plants. They have their own synapomorphies. So we see lots of synapomorphies in these different lineages in bacteria and archaea. So the, you see the same thing in archaea, for example. One lineage of archaea is extremely tolerant of growing in high salt concentrations. They're called the extreme halophiles. And those archaea that are extremely halophilic, able to grow in these high salt conditions, are all in a single clade. It is a monophyletic group within the archaea that is able to grow at high salt concentrations. Again, you see the same thing in eukaryotes. You will hear about these um, quite a bit with various features in plants and animals. It is these, the, the diversity within eukaryotes and within bacteria and archaea is in essence much greater than the diversity between the groups. That's what I'm trying to tell you here. So what we're going to do for um, the rest of the class is now go through some of this diversity in more detail and give you some different ways to think about the diversity um, recapitulating many of the topics that are covered in chapter 26 and 27. Are there any questions about what I just covered before we go into? Yeah. I just have a good question. When you're talking about like the grand home structure and all that, are you saying that this trait of having the three-star wall is kind of like a trait that evolved separately? That's why these people bacteria are only modified by the So if we look at the phylogenetic tree, which I'll show you in more detail in a little bit, you can view the gram positive as basically being a feature that evolved. You can consider the common ancestor of all bacteria to be gram negative and resembling the gram negative bacteria. All bacteria have peptidoglycan cell walls. They all have cell membranes, and most of them look like gram negatives. The common ancestor, if you overlaid this onto a tree, you would see is probably gram negative. And then this gram-positive cell envelope structure, which is shared by two groups, appears to have evolved once because those two groups are sister taxa. So in essence, you can consider them on this branch here or something to that effect. So whatever led to scrapping the gram-negative envelope and create inventing the gram-positive cell wall structure, that appears to have happened just once in evolutionary history. And again, that's actually important. Um, in essence, it tells you that the mechanism by which the gram-positive envelope is created is probably similar between those two different groups. If the gram-positive feature evolves separately in two distinct lineages, you might look for different mechanisms by which those envelopes are made. So knowing the evolutionary history helps you figure out the underlying mechanisms much more accurately. Okay, so um, we're going to switch over to talking about microbial diversity, and I just want to say sort of one thing about what we're going to cover in the next few lectures, and I'm going to call this microbial diversity. But what I really mean is everything in the tree of life except plants, animals, and fungi. That is everything not covered in the rest of the class. It is the vast majority of the phylogenetic diversity of the tree of life. These are the plants here. Here's the fungi, here's the animals, and their sister tax over there. Everything else we're going to cover now in the next few lectures. Most of these are microbial. By microbial, I mean organisms that you cannot see them without the aid of, say, a microscope or a magnifying glass or something of that effect. Um, some of them are not. So giant kelp uh, is in one of these other groups, as we will see uh, in the next lecture. Giant kelp is not small. It's not microbial, but we're going to cover it in here in all the other taxa that are not covered in the plant and animal and fungi lectures. So most of these other taxa are, in fact, microbes. So um, I, I assume you know sort of the general definition, but the definition we're going to use here are microbes are those organisms that you cannot see with the naked eye. And, you know, some of... <laughs> The organisms that we will see here in some of these clades, you can in fact see. So what we're really talking about is, again, not just microbes, but all of these clades of organisms, of which most of the organisms in these groups are small. 
what we could call microbes. So if you pay attention to them, um, most of them have been ignored for a long time because they are small, yet they represent an incredible sort of amount of the diversity of life in a lot of different aspects. So if you take a single gram of soil, that's basically like a little pinch this big, you know, one centimeter by one centimeter. There are upwards of 100 million microbial cells you can find in that gram. All sorts of different types. You could, in many soil types, you would find 50,000 different species. Incredible level of diversity within a single gram of soil. There are more cells of microbes on Earth than there are stars in the universe. So the total number of cells and even the biomass is greater than the biomass in plants and animals. And one thing that people may or may not know is that in and on your body, as we will talk about in one lecture, there are 10 times as many microbial cells as there are human cells. And the genetic diversity in those microbes is actually enormous. And they contribute a lot to our biology. So what we're going to do is walk you through a little bit of this diversity again. And first thing I'm going to talk about is the diversity of form, in essence, shape among the microbes. What you can easily see by looking at them either in a microscope or for the few that are big, not, you don't, may not need a microscope. So in the bacteria and archaea, there are three general shapes, and you've probably heard derivatives coming from these shapes all the time. So the sphere shape, the ball-shaped organisms, are generally called cocci or coccus. So um, many of the pathogens, like staphylococcus, uh, MRSA, streptococcus, a uh, variety of other organisms, those are these ball-shaped organisms, and that's where their name, something ococcus, comes from. That's the, just comes directly from their shape. Many other bacteria, I'll show you pictures of this in a second, are rod-shaped. That's generally called a bacilli. So bacillus anthracis, the causative agent of anthrax, its name, that whole group of organisms, most of them are rod-shaped. That's where their name comes from. And then you will see some of them are, in fact, helical-shaped. And I'm going to come back to the eukaryotes in a second. So here's an example of Enterococcus, this sphere-shaped. E. coli is one of these bacillus rod-shaped organisms. And then there are some of these spiral-shaped organisms, including things like the causative agent of syphilis and a variety of other diseases have these spiral shapes. If we go to the microbial eukaryotes, there are three major classes of sort of shapes that they take. And I'm covering some of this because a lot of chapter 26 then talks about particular groups and it'll just say these are, you know, bacilli shaped or something like that. So you have to sort of understand this background to interpret a lot of what's in chapter 26 and 27. So there are three general shapes for or forms for the microbial eukaryotes. The ciliated, many of those are sort of simple uh, shapes with these hair-like projections called cilia on the outside. Some of them are flagellated. Uh, the shapes can be diverse, but they have a long flagellum or many flagella that are these long whip-like projections that move them around. And then many are amoeboid. That is, they can take lots of different shapes. These are the blobs, basically, uh, and amoeba. And I'm going to show you some pictures of these now. So this is some of the diversity of the, within bacteria and archaea of the sort of sphere and rod and spiral shaped. That's not all the diversity. So you see things like square shaped halophilic archaea, some of those ones I talked about a minute ago. Nobody yet understands how they're able to make square cells. Uh, there are a lot of people really interested in the bioengineering of this. There are lots of other diverse shapes in the bacteria and archaea, but most of them can be shoved into one of these categories. There are, however, many that form multicellular structures. This is a fruiting body of a bacterium uh, called Stigmatella. It's in a group called the Myxococcus group. Um, they form these fruiting body shapes, and they diversify. That is, they are true multicellular organisms. There's another type of multicellularity that's talked about in the book and is really important for a variety of aspects of medicine called biofilms. Many bacteria can form these layered structures where the ones on the surface take on a different phenotype than some of the ones on the inside. True multicellular structures, it appears to be. Um, these are really important for things like antibiotic treatment because it's very hard to get antibiotics into the middle of a biofilm. And organisms that form biofilms can be very resistant to drug treatment. 
There are some bacteria and archaea that are very large, so you might not want to classify them as this sort of microbe definition. This is a bacteria that's the size of the head of a bee, um, a giant bacteria. There are a few of these out there. Not very common, but there are a few of these giant bacteria out there. There's incredible diversity, again, in the form. This is another multicellular uh, bacterium. This is a bacterial species that packages its DNA in a membrane-bound compartment. Sounds like a nucleus. Um, it is not homologous to the eukaryotic nucleus, but it is studied a lot because people are trying to figure out why this organism is sort of packaging its DNA in a way like what eukaryotes do. Many bacteria form these long filaments, chains of the different, you know, individual cells. They're not really multicellular. Each individual cell is basically identical to the other cells, but they form these long chains um, that can stretch for meters sometimes. Uh, this is from the article I sent around from the New York Times yesterday morning on diversity within one or two groups of microbial eukaryotes. So the multicellularity that you see in microbial eukaryotes is incredibly complex and very diverse. These are a couple of different classes of what are called slime molds. We will talk about this a little more in the next lecture, but they take on all these really interesting diverse um, forms, mostly related to uh, fruiting body production or some type of dispersal, um, but they're really completely wild and, and interesting. Uh, there are even some bacteria that basically form seeds. Uh, these are the spore-forming bacteria, like the ones that cause anthrax. Um, they actually form a daughter spore inside the cell, and then they protect it. They package it up and coat it in all sorts of protective coatings, and then the mother cell dies. And those spores can survive for thousands of years and are very resistant to anything you can throw at them, including boiling and radiation etc. So this is just sort of summing up a lot of that diversity. This is one of my favorite ones. This is a microbial eukaryote uh, that um, I was on a deep sea research cruise that one of the grad students found with the Alvin submarine. This single-celled eukaryote is the size of your fist. Um, it's really completely wild. It's in the foraminiferin group. So a single cell, but um, very, very large. There's incredible diversity here, is what I'm trying to tell you, in the form that you see within bacteria and archaea and microbial eukaryotes. So one of the topics that's covered in the book and is also really very interesting is the different ways that um, bacteria and archaea and microbial eukaryotes move. So many people think of uh, microorganisms as not really moving around, but it turns out many of them are very motile. You know, they're small, so they're not moving miles, um, but to them, they're moving very far, very large distances. And there's lots of different interesting mechanisms by which the motility occurs. And you will see lots of examples of this, and there's discussion in the book of some of these different forms. Um, so there are ones that use a flagellum, which is this long whip-like projection that I'll show you a little bit more detail in a minute. They sort of wave it around and they can control the direction by which they move. A lot have uh, cilia, in particular the microbial eukaryotes, that sort of beat and move in certain directions. They can bring in food that way. They can do all sorts of interesting things with the cilia. Some sort of surf. They just glide on surfaces. Others literally tumble. Um, and then there are some really cool ones that live in water that have these gas vesicles, basically gas bubbles, and they control the amount of air in those gas bubbles, and they can float up and down following the light or the temperature or the oxygen in water. So microbes, you should not view them as being immobile. Most of them can move in some way. And I'm going to show you some of this in more detail. So here is a single bacteria that has an incredible number of flagella that it uses to move around. The flagella of bacteria is a really interesting machine. Um, there's lots of detail known about this machine and how it sits in the membrane and then spins around. And you will see in the discussion in the book there are different types of bacteria that use this machine in a variety of different ways. Um, the flagella of bacteria is not in any obvious way homologous to the flagella of archaea or of eukaryotes. Those all seem to be possibly separate inventions of the same concept. Here's a E. coli, a, sorry, a Vibrio bacteria spinning around with its flagellum and some of them can mo are moving in a direction. They can sense chemical gradients and then move towards a chemical that interests them. 
or move away from a chemical that they don't want. And this is how they're able to do things like um, sense iron in the water or move towards particular areas inside your blood in ways that you might not like. Um, these are microbial eukaryotes. So this is a cilia, a uh, ciliated organism, like one of the ones you might see in lab number three. This is a, a flagellated one. Uh, these are both eukaryotes that are moving around quite actively and using their movement for a variety of purposes. These are some of my favorite ones. These are one of some of the gliding ones. This is um, sped up. I could pretend that it's in real time, but they don't move quite that fast. Um, but many of these slime molds, such as the ones shown in that article and other microbial eukaryotes, can move pretty fast across surfaces and envelop things or use that movement in a variety of ways. And again, in the book, there's all sorts of discussion because this is one of the main ways of diversification within the bacteriarchaea and eukaryotes is the means by which they do things like move. Um, so I think all this stuff is cool, um, the shapes and the movement and all that stuff, but you write a grant to a funding agency and you say you want to study all the cool shapes that are found in microbes, and they'll laugh at you. Um, what they generally care about, and what most people generally care about, is what the microbes actually do. What, what are their functions in various environments? What are they, you know, not just what do they look like or how are they moving, but, but how do they influence the world around them? And so what I'm going to do in the next few slides is take you through um, a little tour of some of the functional diversity seen in um, microbes. And it's sort of, I've categorized them into these six different categories. So the microbes that you're probably most familiar with are the ones that cause disease. We will talk about this in more detail in the lecture on human-associated microbes. But many of them are pathogenic and make people, as well as plants and animals, sick. They also can make lots of other organisms sick. There's a very strange thing that nobody yet understands, which is that there are many microbial eukaryotes that can be pathogenic. There are many bacteria that can be pathogenic. And they can be pathogenic of all sorts of different organisms. There are no archaea that are known to be pathogenic of anything. It's a completely vexing thing that nobody understands right now. So there are bacteria that even infect other bacteria. There are bacteria that infect single-cell eukaryotes. There are bacteria that infect all sorts of plants and animals. There are microbial eukaryotes that do the same thing. There are viruses that infect everything. There are some archaea that live inside plants and animals. They do not appear to be detrimental. They appear to be beneficial symbionts. And we'll see an example of that in a minute. There are no archaea that are known to be pathogenic. And Nobody knows why. Some people have some ideas, but it's, it's unclear what's going on there. Uh, many of the microbes that are on the planet uh, have some sort of positive effect on other organisms. So I'm categorizing them as the good microbes. We'll talk about this in more detail. You can call these mutualistic in many cases because the microbe benefits and the other organism benefits. And we'll go through the definition of these uh, in a couple of lectures. For example, in the roots of legumes, um, like beans and clover and other things, um, there are bacteria that fix nitrogen for the host plant. So you can grow legumes in nitrogen-poor soil because of this symbiosis with bacteria that allows the host plant, in essence, to pull bacteria out of the air. It's really the bacteria, and pull nitrogen out of the air. It's really the bacteria that are doing that for the host. There are lots of microbes that fix carbon for their host. The best example of this are the chloroplasts inside plants. As we will see in the endosymbiosis lecture, chloroplasts are actually derived cyanobacteria. That is, they used to be free-living cyanobacteria. That's what carries out almost all of the photosynthesis on the planet. The, um, there also are these other ones, like ones that I actually study, which are, there are bacteria that can fix carbon for animals and make the animals function in a way a lot like plants. So these giant tube worms in the bottom of the ocean that many people may have seen in Discovery Channel videos, these tube worms have no mouth. They have no digestive system. They basically live via these bacteria that live inside of them that pull carbon dioxide out of the water 
turn it into sugars and vitamins and other things, and provide all of the nutrition needed for their host. And there are lots of microbes that aid, for example, in various aspects of nutrition. So cellulolytic, cellulolytic microbes, that is the microbes that can degrade cellulose. Animals generally can't chop up the complicated bonds that are found in cellulose in plants. Microbes can do this really well. So all the organisms, all the animals that you know of that live off of plant matter, all of those really have microbes inside their gut that chop up the plant matter for them. So in the gut of cows and other ruminants, there is a diversity of microbes that chop up the plant material that allows the host to get energy off of it. Same is true for termites and any wood-eating uh, organism. They use microbes inside of them. There's an enormous number of microbes that we will talk about a little bit in the lecture on human-associated microbes that live in and on plants and animals, and we have no idea what they're doing, basically. So I'm calling this the unknown. There are many people that think they might contribute in some positive way, but in general, they're not obviously detrimental. That is, they're not obviously pathogens, and they're not obviously beneficial. So, um, but they're a cloud around all plants and animals, and they probably contribute to their biology in a lot of interesting ways that uh, we're just beginning to learn about. Many of the ones that I study and that we will spend basically a lecture on are what can be called extremophiles, organisms that live in the tail ends of the sort of distribution patterns of organisms. So if you plot where organisms live versus temperature, there are some organisms that can thrive, in fact, prefer to grow at above 100 degrees Celsius. There are some organisms that actually can survive and thrive at very low temperatures. The same is true for very high pH, that is very basic environments, or very low pH, that is very acidic environments. And we're going to talk about these uh, in a little detail. Most of the organisms that are at the edge, the true extremophiles, are microbes. They're the ones that have figured out how to deal with the most extreme conditions on the planet. There are lots of microbes that we use in various um, agricultural and industrial related processes to make things like yummy fermented beverages or cheeses, etc. I'm not going to talk a lot about these. There's lots of cool stuff going on on these organisms right here on campus, but we're just not, we're not going to have time to talk about these a lot. There's a little bit in the book about some of them, um, but there's lots of industrial and applied uses for microbial diversity in lots of different uh, areas. One that we will talk about a little bit is that microbes also play major roles in most or all of the global nutrient cycles on the planet. Carbon, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus, etc. Microbes play major roles in all of these processes. So if you want to do things like model global climate, etc., not including the microbes is probably not the smartest idea in the world, and we'll talk a little bit about this. Um, so that's sort of the, the tour of microbial diversity. And what I included this slide for is to sort of lead into the next topic, which is this is a cartoon, in essence, of all the known metabolic processes of all organisms on the planet. That is, the different ways organisms can take a compound and turn it into something else, say, digest sugar or turn carbon into carbon dioxide into sugars by fixing the carbon or fixing nitrogen or whatever. And if you take all of these processes and you ask, what organisms can carry out these different processes? The vast majority of this sort of metabolic map of the planet is covered by microbes. They are very good at carrying out diverse biochemical reactions. The diversity that we see in biochemical reactions is mostly in microbes. Plants and animals have, in general, very low diversity of the metabolic reactions that they carry out themselves. As we will see in the lecture on symbioses, they don't have to. They can engage with microbes to carry out the processes for them. So plants don't have to fix nitrogen. They can have a symbiont that fixes nitrogen. Animals don't have to degrade cellulose. They can have a symbiont that degrades cellulose for them. So it's not clear if, if microbes weren't here, if plants and animals would have evolved these processes. But given that microbes are around that can carry out all these diverse metabolic processes, it seems like the simplest way for a plant and animal to acquire a new function 
a new metabolic function is to engage in some type of symbiosis with a microbe. So we could talk about a million different things with microbial metabolic diversity. What we're going to do is focus in on one categorization of that diversity. And this will help with a lot of the reading in the book because they talk about what are called the trophy of different organisms. Trophy is, um, comes from the Greek term for nourishment. So these different trophies that we will talk about are the different ways that organisms acquire, in essence, their essential nutrients. And when we compare different organisms to each other, frequently one of the first things people will do is compare their um, categorization in this trophy landscape. So the simplest way to look at this is to take the diverse types of nutritional processes in different organisms and to categorize them in terms of three different components of these processes. So the first is the source of energy. Where do organisms get the energy that they use to carry out their processes? The second is sort of a subtle thing, but it's where organisms get their electrons. So it turns out that electrons are really important for all sorts of biochemical reactions. Electrons allow organisms to reduce various chemicals, and that's important for things like taking sugars and turning them into other compounds. So this is a very important chemical step in the nutrition of all organisms. And then the third category, I mean, there are a million different categories. These are the three main ones people usually care about. The third category is where organisms get their carbon. So carbon is a sort of fundamental component of all of life. We can categorize organisms by where they get their carbon. And if we do this, um, I'm not going to show you all the possibilities. For each of these categories, I'm going to show you the two main possibilities that people talk about and look at in terms of organismal diversity. So for energy source, one of the major sources of energy for organisms on the planet is light. If organisms use light energy, they're called phototrophic. So for example, plants, most of them except for the weird parasitic ones, use the energy of light. They are phototrophs. Organisms that use the energy from chemicals like us, we eat food and we get the energy from that food. Those are chemicals. Those are called chemotrophs. So chemical energy, chemo. Do you have a question? Or? No. So then if we look at the electron source for different organisms, some organisms scavenge their, electron, scavenge their electrons from inorganic compounds, like sulfur. Those are called lithotrophs. Some get their electrons from organic compounds like sugars. Those are organotrophs. For carbon source, some get their carbon from what are called C1 compounds. That is compounds that have just one carbon in them. Carbon dioxide, methane, carbon monoxide, um, etc. Organisms that are able to get their carbon from those C1 compounds are generally called autotrophs. Another term that's frequently used is to say that they fix carbon. That is, they convert carbon into other things, these C1 compounds. Organisms that get their carbon from organic compounds are called heterotrophs. So if we look at different organisms on the planet, we can categorize them in each of these and build a very complex compound name to describe their metabolism. So the bacterium E. coli gets its energy from chemicals, its electrons from organic compounds, and its carbon from organic compounds. It is therefore called a chemo-organo-heterotroph. Sometimes people just throw out the organo part and say chemo-heterotroph. For photosynthetic organisms like plants and cyanobacteria, they get their energy from light, they get their, inorganic, they get their electrons from inorganic compounds, and their carbon from C1 compounds. And they are called photolithoautotrophs, or photoautotrophs. 
And we will continue in the next lecture with talking more about the phylogenetic diversity of organisms. It's hard to know how to cover such diversity. It's, that's right. it's just impossible. So. I had that one yeah. last so the main issue is that when we talk about um, uh, ancestral and derived traits, we're always referring to a particular group of organisms in the tree. So that's how, in that question, you can have things that are both ancestral and derived. Right? So let's draw three. Yeah. For this reason, A is the ancestral state. But for this whole group, a is a derived state. Does that make sense? So, so it's always referring to a particular group of organisms. And many of the things that we're going to talk about are completely contingent upon what group you're looking at. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you're like the 11th person who asked that exact same thing. Oh, really? Yeah, I know. Yeah, I mean, I the last minute, but I no, no, no. I mean, it's I, clearly everybody is, is thinking about the same thing. Yeah.